Hi, this is Barry NDR. Without a doubt, one of my best sources for on the ground accurate information has got to be Rogue Money. I'm really pleased to have as my guest V, the guerrilla economist, founder of Rogue Money. We're going to be discussing the importance of having a plan B that's well rounded and covers all bases, what people should be doing to best protect themselves for the upcoming possible chaos that seems to be setting into place where various nations may be going in the not too distant future and how to best protect yourselves and your family so without any further delay it's my great pleasure to introduce you to V the gorilla economist from one of my favorite websites rogue money V it's a pleasure to be talking together thanks for taking the time to being here Oh, it's a pleasure, Barry. It's uh, good to be here. It's a great day, uh, you know, hectic uh, last couple of months, but uh, I'm glad to be talking to you. Right sounds, from the sounds excellent. Uh, if you're good with it, I'd like to veer into what perhaps might be viewed as a dissimilar content compared to most interviews you've done in the past. Sure. Primarily the two subjects I'd like you to share your thoughts are on how to best survive the upcoming global turmoil and secondly, the importance of having a well-rounded plan B. Uh, whether it's on our DR, drscapes.com site or our recently released sister site, somethingfeelswrong.com, our readers consistently find accurate to the ground, on the ground information on both these imperative to understand subjects. I'm excited to hear your thoughts, so with that in mind, you're ready to go with the first question? Yeah, absolutely. Let's rock and roll. Excellent. On both our sites, we consistently stress the importance of having a well-balanced, flexible plan B. After being in over 100 countries and actually living in six, various personal experiences have taught me a flexible plan B is a must, and it must include some sort of documented backed exit strategy. Several well-recognized occurrences in the past have proven expatriation can represent the best option if violence becomes uncontrollable. History will only prove this time and time to be correct. V, share your views on the importance of having a well-thought-out plan B, and what are some of the key points you feel should be included within it? Oh, that's a great question. I think it's a it's a very loaded question. So let's well, I'm gonna try and un- unpack it and, and unbox it as best as I can. Uh, first things first, Barry. I think um, history has shown us very clearly that having a plan B is 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 not something that should be an afterthought. It should be absolutely essential for every single person that's living in the developed world. I mean, what we consider to be uh, quote unquote the developed world, the you know. Um, developed nations and, and civilization is something that is uh, really a thin veneer that can rapidly deteriorate and go from uh, paradise to peril rather quickly. Now, um, you know, again, you know, historically, you know, we, we've seen this happen in Nazi Germany, we've seen this happen in Soviet Russia and Communist China and, and all other uh, despotic areas throughout the world uh, throughout history that those who are not prepared tend to become the victims, okay? And those who are prepared are not only able to survive and thrive, but are also able to leverage the situation for their benefit, okay? Um, in terms of a well-situated prep, and it's, a, it's pretty interesting as I speak to you about this, because, you know, the majority of Americans have no clue what offshoring is. They have no idea what a Plan B uh, location should look like what, or what it should be. Uh, whereas the rest of the world, many, you know, when I talk to clients from Asia, when I talk to clients from uh, from uh, the Middle East and or even in some cases even Europe, uh, they have an idea of offshoring. They have an idea of Plan B. In fact, most of the world, that, you know, that are, that are industrious uh, typically have some sort of an offshore account. OK, so uh, it's absolutely vital because, if again, when things deteriorate and when you look at the economic statistics of the United States, uh, we are absolutely heading for an implosion. We are, you know, people always ask me all the time, Barry, hey, uh, when's the collapse happening, V? When is the collapse happening? And the, the issue, the, 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 the thing that people need to understand is not when it's happening, it's that it's already happened. Uh, we've been collapsing since 2009. We've been on life support. We've been, you know, we're like the, uh, the, 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 the body, the, the, you know, the patient being rolled into the ER. You know, we, you know, our vitals are crashing, and it's, it's only through heroic intervention that we're being, that we, we even have a pulse. So, look at that, you can see that analogy how it is today, where, 
you know, economically, it's nothing but heroic intervention that's keeping us afloat and keeping this economy going. They can't do those um, those um, those accounting gymnastics forever. They can't do the market market manipulation forever. So it's absolutely vital. So one of the things that people need to do is number one, have some sort of a backup uh, banking system. Do something offshore. And I know I understand uh, that. Uh, you know, there are many locales in the world that allow, you know, that if you try to open up a secondary bank account, you gotta, you know, go through FATCA, this, that, and the other. But there are still a handful of places in the world where you can get by with that. So, it is important to have some, you know, have an offshore account. Secondly, uh, it's important to, you know, position yourself in a place where it's, you know, it's tranquil, stable government, uh, you know, um, nothing too, you know, uh, chaotic. Uh, a nation that has good resources, good weather. Um, and then plant yourself there. You get some sort of a residency status going, uh, you know, get a passport program going, whatever it needs, you know, whatever you need to do to get yourself set up, have that done. And once, you know, because the key is, is to get out of the way before the crap hits the fan and uh, escape. And then if you want to, you can come back from a position of power and leverage the situation to your advantage. That's always a smart thing to do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I wanted to expand a bit. You did mention a second passport. It's a fact throughout history. Uh, owning a second passport is one of the most effective ways of personal protection. Uh, for any of the viewers that might have been wondering what I previously meant when I used the term documented exit strategy, owning a second passport would, would be viewed as one, uh, one form of it. I was floored to find out, though, V, that less than 50% of Americans even own an American passport. During explosive conditions like revolution, martial law, or all-out war, mobility is often a lifesaver. So here's my second question. How would you rank the importance of owning a second passport, and why are such a vast majority, particularly of U.S. citizens, seemingly clueless when it comes to understanding the urgency of that fact? You know, it, it, Americans suffer not only from... Um a normalcy bias. Okay, they have a cognitive dissonance. They have a complete mental disconnect as to, you know, what is going on outside in the broader scale of not only uh, their village and or town or county or state or their even country, but what's going on internationally and how that affects them at their local level. They have no clue of that. Their 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 minds cannot stretch to that limit because they're too busy. Okay, they're too busy. You know. Uh, running the house. They're too busy, you know, taking care of household expenses. They're too busy raising kids. They're too busy watching football. They're too busy shopping. They're too busy partying. They're too busy sh- drinking. And this is what's going on. So we have this mental disconnect. So, uh, and they're under this preconceived notion, this, this false narrative, this false hope that, hey, you know what? Uh, it will never happen in America. Everything will be fine. And, uh, we will once again, uh, go through the, uh, anything that will happen because uh, everything's a cycle and we'll always be number one. That's not the case. When you look at all the metrics, you look at the real numbers. We've been in decline for quite some time right now. So, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't behoove me. It, I mean, it, it doesn't uh, uh, surprise me that uh, that Americans do not. Majority of Americans don't even have a, uh, a passport, let alone even knowledge of having a secondary passport. I mean, honestly, man, it's sad to say I live in one of the most dumbest countries on planet Earth. I really do. In terms of the industrialized world, I've never met so many idiots in my life. Do you, just just to add on to that, bro, is, is it, do you notice it changing a little bit? You see, I haven't been in America since uh, 85, 1985. You're not missing anything. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, well, we'll get, maybe come out here sometime and we'll show you a good time for a week or something. But seriously, dude, is it, is, do you notice it changing a little bit? And, and, and I have to rely on people I talk to for information. I can fill you in about this country, you know, but all the survival questions about I get from America or this country, if I don't live there, I don't know. But do you see a changing guy? I mean, there is a uh, an awakening occurring. Uh, I think that's anywhere between one to three percent of the population, uh, maybe a little bit more. Who knows? But um, there is an awakening. People are getting sick of the status quo, and I, I think this election cycle has really put a, a light upon that issue. And uh, you know, guys like you know Donald Trump is clearly uh, the uh, symptomatic reaction to a much greater problem. He is the uh, the uh, embodiment of all that is. Um, all that anger that the American public has towards the establishment, he is the uh, the epitome of that. 
And um, he's symbolic in that regard. So, yeah, there is an awakening going on, thanks to guys like, you know, Trump and, uh, and heck, even Sanders when he came on board. You can see that this, there was a massive push away from establishment, away from the status quo. So there is a change going on in that regard. Uh, in terms of uh, media, in terms of information, uh, the alternative media is winning in the United States. Um, when you look at the approval rating for mainstream media right now, I think it's, 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 it's a 6% or less approval rating for mainstream media. So uh, pretty exciting stuff, man. It really is. From your understanding about the numerous different directions in which the future may unfold, consider on the following few points. The threat of war is spreading rapidly. Perhaps worse is even the present lack of force I call NATO. The never-ending jobs program some prefer to call terrorism. The second job program some prefer to call the U.S. military, which is swallowing 56% of the GNP of the country. Demoralization, random violence, not to even mention the crumpling economies of the world. With so many potential black swans and adding to that your personal thoughts of how you see things panning out, I'm sure many of my viewers would like to know the following. In the U.S., if things get really uncontrollable, have you personally thought of an expatriation as an, uh, as expatriation as an option? Absolutely. One thousand percent. You know, uh, you know, uh, I, one of the locales that, that, that I'm invested in is, uh, is, is Panama. That's one of the, uh, the locations that I, uh, that I like. I mean, uh, I have clients that are in DR, in, in the Dominican Republic as well. So, uh, people are looking at the Caribbean. People are looking at Central, uh, as well as South America. But again, not everywhere in Central and South America is, is ideal. You don't want to, you know, pick up and leave and move to Venezuela. That's not something you'd want to do. So, <laughs> you know, an interesting thing about that though, because I have quite a few subscribers from Venezuela, and uh, when you translate from their Spanish to English, yeah, they really want to know in the broken English how come they don't tell about us. I'm talking about my people that live in the farm belts. They're not missing food one iota. It's everything no. you hear is about Caracas. Yeah, it is. It, it, everything is centered around uh, Caracas and the, and the major cities. Um, it, it, because, you know, when you look at those nations, people that are in farms, people that are um, in the rural countryside, they are much more self-sufficient. So these currency hikes don't really af affect them uh, the way they do in, in, like, the major cities like Caracas, where it's so totally socialized, where everything is handed to them. So when the mechanism that hands them the stuff no longer functions, people panic. Yeah. Another area of survival deals with financial survival. Financial institutions in several other nations have multiple advantages gained by using them. A much higher cash reserve of up to 20% is not considered uncommon. Superior interests on CDs and other forms of accounts, plus they tend to have vast amounts of experience when dealing with various currencies of the world, so it makes offshore banking a thing to consider. While doing some research for a prior post, and as hard as this is going to be to grasp fee, 0.03 of Americans own a foreign bank account. Zero three of a percent. Yeah. By a wide margin, like you said earlier, this ranks the lowest percentage of any developed nation. What would happen if currency controls were to come into effect? How is it so that so many of them are, are missing this in a, in a developed nation, this safety net that comes with owning a foreign bank account? And here's the fourth question. In a nation that seemingly ranks itself first, how can it be that such a small percentage of its citizens realize the importance of owning a foreign bank account? Yeah. Well, again, it's the American normalcy bias, number one, and the dollar is forever, and the American economy will go on in perpetual. And that is just nonsense. Uh, it is important not only to have a foreign offshore bank account, but you need to be, you know, you, you need to have something set up that is completely outside of any sort of banking system to begin with. That's why I'm a, a huge proponent of uh, the LBMA uh, certified gold or, or good delivery system for gold and silver, Okay, which is basically you, you have a system between uh, vaulting companies, refiners, uh, brokers. Uh, this is held outside of the banking system. So the good delivery network is, is basically something that everybody should be involved in it if you can get into it because – it allows you to keep your wealth in precious metals, okay, outside of the banking system, vaulted in the correct jurisdictions that is outside of U.S. authority, okay, and it gives you liquidity. So if you got a hundred thousand sitting in gold, 
and you need to liquidate 10, 20 grand because you have an emergency, if you're in the right setup, in the right system, they can, it can be done in 24 hours. If you need deliverability of the gold, they can deliver it directly to your front door anywhere in the world. Uh, and when you divest or when you want to liquidate, you can liquidate in, uh, in, in the currency of your choosing, in the bank account of your choice. So this is, this is all vital to the strategy. So not only do you want to set up something offshore, but you want to make sure you have an offshore hard asset account to go along with your offshore bank account. It's vital. It's necessary. It is foolhardy to think otherwise you could be vested in one currency or paper to begin with, which will be toxic and, um, you know, it, 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 all paper currencies will be affected with what is going to come. So you want to be in hard assets right now. V, you're, you're promoting that. When, when your clients are somewhat on the, let's say, innocent side of that kind of subject, are you going out of your way and really promoting that to them to get them on board or making your best attempt to get them on board to understanding this? Uh, every single person that I talk to that, that, is, that has the means to do it, I, I urge them to do it. It's, it's vital. I've done it for myself. Every single one of my clients that I work with, um, they're all in the same type of system where they have an offshore account, they have an offshore uh, asset protected trust, offshore corporations, they own, uh, you know, an offshore uh, uh, gold fund that's in the uh, LBMA uh, good delivery system, mm -hmm. uh, which is free from any third party uh, counter risk and uh, it's not held by the banks, it's outside the banking system and it's the most strict and stringent system in the world. Okay, so it's, it's something that's much more of a better strategy for those that have the means to do it, better than going to Jimmy John's Coin and Carry and getting a whole bunch of silver and gold and sitting on it. And that, that's not a smart thing to do, especially if you have societal chaos and, uh, you know, what's going to happen to your silver and gold when somebody comes breaking in through your door? You mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So th these are the strategies that people need to have. I should be doing an interview uh, very soon with Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, and I want to quote from a recent post of his Armageddon Approaches. Mm -hmm. Americans need to wake up to the dangerous situation that Washington has created, but I doubt they will. Most wars happen without the public's knowledge until they happen. I and a few others try to alert people to the real threats that they face, but our voices are not loud enough. Not even Vladimir Putin's voice is loud enough. It looks like the West won't hear until there remains nothing at all of the German and NATO troops and of Poland and Romania and possibly the rest of us. Do you agree with that line of thought? Yeah, I, I think the, uh, see the, the West is run by a bunch of emasculated, um, feminized neo-Nazis. That's, that's who these men are that run the West, okay? These emasculated, feminized uh, neo-Nazis. You know, these guys have very low testosterone levels. They've never been into a fight in their life. And they got something to prove, so it, it's worse than a Napoleon complex. So these guys think that they can, you know, be bellicose and they can rattle some sabers and, and the Russians are going to kowtow. They don't realize that, you know, in terms of missile technology, Russia's at least two generations ahead. They can wipe the floor with NATO. Uh, those who followed me on, on, on Rogue Money and with my staff, uh, you know, of writers, the team of writers that I have over there, we've, we've documented this very clearly. Um, and, and, you know, we foreshadowed a lot of the events that are occurring today. Uh, with the spe specific situation with Russia and NATO. Uh, NATO st stands no chance of, of winning. I mean, it, it's suicide for the U.S. to go um, looking for war against the, the Russians and the Chinese. Okay, this whole, you know, Chinese aggressive expansion in the South China Sea. China just took over six islands that belonged to them historically since 680 A.D. Okay? Uh, Vietnam has over 30-some-odd islands in the area. Philippines, I think, has 15 or 16 islands, okay? Malaysia has a handful as well. China takes six, and all of a sudden, the United States gets their panties in a bunch. Mm -hmm. this, is, this, is a, this is a dangerous game of saber-rattle. Now, the funniest thing is this, okay? Uh, Russia and China are both holders of U.S. debt, even though they are divesting and dumping the dollar at an alarming rate, okay? Um, the cre the, the uh, debtor nation, historically, should never threaten the creditor nation. It's stupid to do so. So, I think, is the West going to, you know, march us in this line of war and, and rhetoric? Yeah, they're going to do it. But what's going to happen is the Russians and the Chinese will pull the plug on the dollar way before that happens. Once that occurs, uh, good luck trying to fuel your ships. Good luck especially trying to fuel your ships when OPEC is about to dissolve itself and you won't have the Saudis to pump your gas lines full, full with oil. It's just not going to happen. Um, so these are the things that are, that are happening globally. 
uh, it's being, you know, you know, these guys are going for broke, but they are the ones who will be broke. And in every level and in every regard, the wealth is going from the, from the West and it is winding up alongside with the power to the East. Yeah, one one area though, I uh, I tend to not try to put blame on on any one particular side because you know this is nothing more than a, a normal paradigm shift. When you're on top of the right. world, any direction you wavers down. Yeah. And I mean, since World War II, it's a hell of a kick at the cat. And I don't think there'll ever be another nation that did as much in as short a time as America did in its right. heyday. But like anything, change is the only thing that's constant. Yeah. Do you think in the last minute some the American citizens are going to grab their ego and kind of put it in the pocket before this this gets to that level or no? Uh, I, I hope to God they grab their ego and they start, you know, start stop beating their chest, screaming to the world how free they are. Uh, it's the most stupidest thing in the world. It's a bunch of slaves, uneducated, most of them. Most of them are very low IQ. Uh, most of them just don't get it. Most of them are brain dead. Most of them can't even think cognitively or critically. And they need to really wake up. And, and there is an awakening happening, and I thank God for all the millions that are awake. And uh, uh, the goal is to, you know, put our, give ourselves a major gut check, face the reality that hey, we're not the exceptional nation that we think we are. We have a whole litany of issues and problems. Let's deal with those issues. Let's pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. Let's get these cronies out of Washington. Probably throw them in jail and or execute them, and then move on with life. Let's rebuild this nation. Let's, you know, let's make it great again. It's very interesting you're making that point because of uh, over the 500 or 600 people we've actually toured around here and relocated several of them. That's what we do, try to make it as seamless as possible for them. Um, it's very interesting. I find that the Western folks are the ones screaming the loudest about we're from the land of the free. But if you do anything like drive with a beer in your car or open up a bottle of rum while you're walking down the street, they're the first ones yelling, what are you, crazy? You're going to get arrested. Yeah, you don't even have to do that. Just, uh, you know, stand in the TSA line. You see how free you are. Yeah, it, it's it's absolutely amazing. What you're saying is coming in crystal clear because I'm seeing the view from the outside in. And, yeah, you're backing up what I'm saying. Uh, v, on post-World War II, the transfer from the uh, sterling to the dollar as a reserve took place. I don't understand where the thought originated that this would remain the case forever. That in itself makes little sense, but for the most part, the gospel still remains intact. Over the past four years, I've taken a lot of flack from both my subscribers and the alternate media regarding my position on the dollar. While I understand the fact, there's no question about the dollar being overvalued currently, and I mean as we're speaking, I still see nothing out there that's ready to take its place. There's nothing currently that's holding the volume, convertibility, and yes, even the confidence in the U.S. dollar. You mentioned countries are fleeing it. I agree totally. But the media never talks about the private sector that's flowing into it. Mm -hmm. They only cover 50 percent uh, of it. But at the time of our interview, four years later, uh, I mean, the U.S. dollar is still running about 96 on the dollar index. And, and I know it's unsustainable. And, and, but, but the point is, all things considered, including the scuttlebutt about the WAN and the SDR, share your thoughts on how much longer the dollar can hold it together before something similar to a Grisham's law comes into effect. Yeah. Oh, well, the dollar, I think the whole dollar system will probably last another, you know, uh, 10 to 12 months at the most, man. I, I, I don't see, this thing is being stretched to the absolute limit. It's being sustained via bond fraud. It's being sustained through the, 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 the chicanery that's happening in the repurchase order market that's keeping the U.S. dollar index artificially high. You cannot keep this stunt going for, for long. Now, in terms of liquidity, convertibility, and all that, the yuan is surging. Now, people will say, oh, look at the IMF. The, the, the yuan is going to the IMF. That is a Trojan horse play. China's focus is not the stupid IMF. The stupid IMF is an insolvent institution. Mm -hmm. It is another broken, solvent institution created by broken, solvent nations, particularly the broken, solvent United States. The real power structure is the AIIB, the Asian Investment Infrastructure Bank. That is a bank that is made up of, and is the rival to the IMF, it's made up of over 57 nations and counting. Okay? And recently the IMF was begging the AIIB for a loan. That's how broke the IMF is. Okay? Uh, China has been funding the IMF for the last two years. It's not the United States. They haven't 
put a penny into the IMF. So it's a changing of the guard. Hence, Christine Lagarde, the woman that I call the giraffe-necked woman of the IMF. <laughs> she, Sorry. Yeah, no, no worries. The, the, the giraffe-necked woman of the, uh, of the IMF, she came forth and said, don't be surprised if one day the IMF's headquarters will wind up in Beijing. Why is that? Because it is a vacuum pull. Now, people say, well, you know, the, you, the dollar is the most traded. Well, that trade is really rapidly declining. I mean, we went into 2001 with 76% of global trade being done in the dollar, and that number has fallen precipitously. It depends on which firm you're looking at. I've seen numbers as low as, low as 48%, okay, down uh, from, you know, it's, it's, it's right, um, 48, 48% usage, you know, down from 76, 78%. So it's a big drop. Now, um, what does this mean? Well, when people say that the dollar, the, you know, the dollar is the most liquid and people are jumping into it, they're jumping into it because of fear. In other words, they're jumping out of the Lusitania into the Titanic. All right? What's happening, you've got a lot of these Euro weenies. Okay? These are the emasculated men and financiers of Europe who are running from the rape fugies that are running rampant, destroying the European continent. And there, and all the economic turmoil that goes along with a bunch of morons that can't run a lemonade stand, let alone a central bank and or financial institution, and they're fleeing into the quote-unquote safe haven. Well, to these morons, the safe haven is the dollar. It's paper. These idiots don't learn. So that's why you're seeing this massive, again, demand, this artificial demand created for the dollar. It's those idiots that are jumping out of the Lusitania and into the Titanic. Now, when you look at China, China is the most liquid market on the planet. It's the most liquid market. Okay, they we, number one. Number two, four out of the five largest banks on the planet are Chinese, the largest being ICBC, which is a monstrous bank. They're much larger. Okay, the only Chinese banks that I just mentioned, they're much larger, uh, much more well capitalized than any of their Western counterparts or cohorts. So the changing of the guard is happening. The, the restructuring of the of of of, of, of you know, the, the the AIIB. The uh, the New Development Bank, which is formerly known as the BRICS Bank, which the, that's the uh, counter to the World Bank. The Chinese SIPs, the, the China Interpayment System, which is the alternative to SWIFT. Mm -hmm. That is a changing of the guard. That is the, that is the end of, that is the death knell. Okay? Because when you lost the ability to control wire transfers via SWIFT, which is using the Fed wire, when you've lost that ability, you're done. Well, yeah, okay, Yosemite so, Sam shot himself in the foot with that one, too, eh? So, oh, Yosemite Sam shot himself in the mouth with that. Yeah. Okay, so what's, ha what's occurred at this juncture is that everything that, that is needed for a transition from the dollar to a new system is already in place. Everything is there. And uh, when you look at the new Silk Road and the new Silk Belt, you look at the Eurasian trade zone, you look at what's happening with ASEAN, you look at the entire eastern uh, state of play, you're seeing this massive trade conglomerate, a global, uh, a, an eastern alliance of trade and, and manufacturing and, and commerce that's emerging that's going to be, you know, 70% of global GDP, you know, uh, 70 some odd percent of, of, uh, of, of manufacturing, 60% of all trade being centered into one location. The West is losing this bad because they have nothing to offer except paper. You know, China's Shanghai compo the, 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 the Shanghai Gold Exchange, when that opened up in April, okay, that began the tractor pull for gold. And then you see the price of gold jump in June, hit, hitting 1300 And we're going to be hitting $1,400 uh, an ounce very soon as well. So we're on, things are on the move. China Does China want to be the world reserve currency? No, they don't want that. They no, don't need no, too much no. risk. Mm -hmm. Let gold and gold derivatives, like a gold trade settlement no note, let that become once again a world reserve currency or a peg on which a, on various currencies could play on. That's the world that they're entering into. Uh, I mean, right now, look, as I'm talking to you, Barry, 25 of the largest economies on the planet are, have already set up currency swaps to trade amongst themselves without even using the dollar. It's game over. Geographically, I'm surprised how so many miss that fact between Russia and China. It only makes sense. No, to uh, the, average, the average idiot American... They're thinking Russia is like the, the, you know, Rocky Three Days. It's like Soviet Communist Russia. Ivan Drago is running the military and, and, and Gorbachev is still in power. They, they think that's what Russia is. They, they have no idea Moscow has skyscrapers. They have no idea that the Moscow stock market was the most stock market of 2015. They have no idea that there's more billionaires per capita in Moscow than any place in the United States. 
They have no friggin' clue that China, Beijing are cracking. I mean, China and places like India are cracking billionaires at a rate that that outstrips us. Oh, even a, even a even a middle-sized city in China like Guangzhou is larger than the ten most populated states put together. Right. I mean, you can't. You, it's amazing, but 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 the thing is, uh, on a geographical basis. But why isn't the media portraying a lot more of what this unbreakable bond is between Russia and China? And I know what it is, and it's not gas and oil. It's water. It's potable water. Mm-hmm. China's hurting desperately for potable water. Russia has 27 percent of the world's fresh water supply, and out of one lake, I think it's Baliki, they're they, they're supplying all of China. Why is that not being made public? This is not a relationship that is going to break apart. No, absolutely right, and uh, it's not being reported because uh, what's what, what what's most important for the American media is uh, how much bigger. Uh, Kim Kardashian's rear end is getting, uh, what type of uh, haircut does Justin Bieber have, and uh, who's winning the Super Bowl this year. That's what uh, is the headlines for the American media. So, you forgot Next Hell Cup, man. You forgot Next Hell oh, Cup. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, for the NASCAR fans out there, Next Hell Cup. You know, that's, yeah. that's, that's, the, uh, that's what the, the American media is, is, is uh, focusing on because it's a controlled media. It's a, it's a controlled, uh, co-opted operation. Uh, I don't expect. I mean, when I was growing up, you had 54 media companies in the country. Uh, now there's only four. So you got four, four, uh, uh, you know, uh, idiots in a, in a boardroom deciding what the rest of the schmucks will be listening to and thinking about and watching. So that, that's the travesty of, of U.S. media. Then we say how, and then we beat our chest and tell the world how free we are. Yeah, I'm hearing you with the bald head under the bandana, right? Uh, <laughs> Listen, even though I took a lot of considerable amount of criticism for my view on the dollar, it, you know, that was five years ago, but it is what it is today. Nothing compares to the hate mail I received on regards to the views on PMs. Now, while I promote the importance of PMs, being part of anyone's portfolio on Plan B, that's not where I took the slack. It was, I took the slack on the valuation aspects that seemed to drive home the majority of this hate mail. When I went on record uh, four years prior stating, while every market eventually has its day, the PM market is not yet ready for prime time. You wouldn't, you won't be seeing the triple digit silver and the five, six thousand dollar plus gold that's been promised by both metal promoters and fear porn clickbait sites. Well, the emails from the gullible came in, V, like you wouldn't believe. But here we are, mid-2016. We're hovering around, what, 18-something, 19 for silver, and gold's around 1340. What are you advising your subscribers about the importance, which you've already touched on, what PMs and in what form, and how might they want to store it? Uh, in terms of uh, spot price, I, I don't care what the spot price is. I always tell my clients, uh, don't buy it based on spot price. If it dips low, you buy low. Okay? If it's, I don't, I don't care because it's a fictitious, bogus BS, uh, uh, you know, number. You know, I mean, the spot price is basically decided upon a bunch of cunt by, you know, in London by by nations who have no gold. They're somehow dictating the price of gold. That's changing very quickly and rapidly. So Ditto on the dollar, right, bud? I mean, yeah. I don't know why people aren't selling high now and buying things in foreign currencies. Exactly. I mean, because that's the way people are. They they, they buy high and they sell low. So <laughs> that's, that's the way people are, man. Guess they make it up on volume. Yeah. <laughs> they make it up on, on, on stupidity. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> but, um... In terms of uh, what what bullion, man, if you're gonna go, you know, if, if you got if you got less than a hundred grand, let's say you got less than fifty grand, you want to, you know, buy gold. Uh, Canadian maple leaves, big fan, big fan of the gold. Canadian maple leaves, silver Canadian maple leaves. Um, I like American eagles. Uh, Chinese pandas are, are are good, but I like to stick with the. Uh, honestly, my favorite thing is it's definitely Canadian maple leaves because it's it, it's high quality coin. And the premiums are a little bit less than what you would get from any one ounce American uh, silver eagle. Now, if you got more than 100k, or if you got more than 50, between 50 and 100k, or even north, you got a million dollars or more. You need to be thinking about offshoring it, getting yourself uh, an LBMA certified, um, you know, good delivery system. You know, if, if people have any questions on that, you can always contact me at v at roguemoney.net, I'll explain to you how the whole process works, and then you decide for yourself what you want to do. 
But that's what I would do. And in that case, you're going to get LBMA certified gold bars and or silver bars. These are, you know, one kg, um, or, or, and we even have smaller, uh, ones as well. But, you know, these bars are serial numbers. So you punch in that serial number. We know where the bar has been mined. We know where it's refined. We get all our stuff directly from the Swiss re- uh, refiners like Auger Horse. Okay. Uh, we get it directly from those Swiss refineries. It's minted. It's not some, you know, cast you know, cheapy thing. It's an, it's a minted gold bar. In, in other words, it's it's the type of bullion, uh, you know, bullion bar that China and Russia, when they need to get gold, they get it from LBMA certified refineries, and they vault it in LBMA vaults. And we typically vault in uh, in Singapore or Hong Kong. Uh, we do have access to we have vaults in, in uh, Switzerland, uh, New York, L.A., Toronto, Frankfurt, London. But our our favorite locations in terms of the tightest jurisdictions is definitely Singapore is our number one location. Too. It's even better than Switzerland at this juncture. Yeah, I would tend to agree wholeheartedly on that. V, uh, I wanted to ask you, are you currently aware right now that if a citizen of America tries to ship out their personal medals, they can't already? Are you aware of that? Uh, like, like I want to send two monster boxes of uh, you know one silver and one one gold to my aunt uh, you know Joni over in Montreal where I'm from. You can't exit the country with it without a tin number stating that you're a metal house. Uh, in some states, like I think it's Montana or Minnesota, they they're they're doing something like that. Um, there's ways to get around it. I mean. It, Again, like with, with the logistics company that, that I deal with, we're one of the largest logistics companies on the planet. Uh, we, I mean, we've been around for over 50 years and we handle 75% of the world's diamonds. It gives you a scale of who we are. But in terms of that, I mean, I've had clients who, who are, let's say in California or New York, they want to have their, their gold or silver shipped to Uruguay. We pick it up directly from their house and, and drop it off because it, it's a different system. Now, if you were to go ahead and you know do that, where you bring it on your own person via aircraft, or you try to do it through FedEx or whatnot, um, yeah, you could run into problems. But you know, using a, a logistics provider, um, you know that that, spe- that specializes in handling precious metals, you won't have any issues. Well, right, because they're they're actually having a tin number and they're a metal distributor, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But the and private the person is running into a dead end right now. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it's the private person is screwed. This is why you cannot operate in the United States without a corporation. I mean, this country respects no laws anymore. The only laws it respects is corporate law. Hence, in two thousand, I think in two thousand nine or two thousand ten, the Supreme Court ruled that corporations have more rights than people. Well, hence the Straw Man Act, but uh, that's for another day, but exactly. Uh, the other thing, um, you're still aware that uh, your maples and your eagles and uh, whatever, your Australian, any coin that's still a usable currency is still, for the time being, traveling at face value of the coin. Like a silver eagle travels at a dollar. It doesn't travel, so that, that makes owning that type of silver or gold much more transportable for the average person. Hey, V, following the recent Brexit, uh, Le Pen vows to hold a French referendum to leave the EU titled the Frexit. Joining France are five other countries vowing to hold their own referendums for leaving the EU. Holland Aid is running around at 10% approval rating. Merkel's CDU came in third place in her home state. Things are moving fast towards Europe breaking apart. Personally, I felt this had to be the end result for decades. The euro was a bad idea from its concept. Where do you see this heading, and what effect will this play on Western nations? Well, you know, the whole entire EU is fracturing. Uh, the, 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 the kleptocrats that run the EU out of the power of, uh, of stupidity, which is in, which is in Belgium, um, you know, in Brussels, uh, these guys are clueless. Their, their, their solution to the failure of the EU is more and more controls, more and more regulations, more, no one's going for that. And, and I'm telling you, Merkel's done. She's, she's finished. You know, Moti Merkel, she is done. And when she gets yanked out of there and thrown out of office, which will be, you know, soon enough, and they, you're going to have a nationalistic candidate in Germany, as well as Marie Le Pen, she will take over France. It's a nationalistic, nationalistic candidate. If you, because, the globalists for many decades, Barry, they've been running a, a, uh, a, you know, again, their globalization effort, right? Being a globalist and an internationalist and blah, blah, blah. Well, 
these idiots don't realize for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. That's why you're seeing globally the rise of nationalism. Nationalism is on the rise in France, it's on the rise in Germany, it's on the rise in Austria, it's on the rise in Hungary, it's on the rise in the UK, it's, uh, it's, it's on the rise in, in Spain, in, in the US, in, in, heck, even in Canada, you know, so these things are happening, and um, the, the, once the exit of France goes, and I'm telling you, Germany's going to go first, and Germany holds 90% of French debt, so when Germany goes, France will go along with them, and that's the end of the EU. You're going to have a, uh, probably a new uh, currency union that's going to be erupting over there, which will possibly be um, the, the northern European countries, you know, creating their own trade zone and integra- integrating, I'm sorry, integrating uh, into the Eurasian trade zone, the New Silk Road, the whole nine yards. That's, that's where the whole entire thing is going. Uh, the U.S. is the most resistant force to that. That's where they're using their puppets in NATO and whatnot to forestall the whole entire transition. Well, Germany is the EU, basically. Oh, it is the biggest engine there. So once that, once she goes, it's it's done. It's, you're gonna have a bunch of a uh, bunch of nutless wonders in Brussels, you know, uh, having meetings where nobody's gonna attend. It's gonna be talking about what they're gonna be doing, and it, it, it's pointless. You know, I mean, have you seen that guy von Rumpy? Yeah. Hey, well, what, look at that guy. He looks like a goblin. You know, the funny thing is, even Brzezinski, you know, came out last week about saying our our plans basically aren't going to... The thing oh, people are missing, though, but, but, but the thing is, people have always took it as gospel that United States was meant to be the leading nation. No, it's meant one world government and one world currency. Nor is it written that America was supposed to be the go-to source to enable it all. And they don't care. I mean, as far as I'm saying, I, I, wrote, a, I wrote an article, Brzezinski just altered course a bit. Yeah, he can believe what he wants, and he's still a paid puppet, but the point is they don't care where as long as they get their one-world government and their one-world currency. They don't care where it comes from, and that's, that's the big mistake he's making. His plan might not be working, granted, but that doesn't mean they don't control all the plans at this point. The thing with Brzezinski, and I, I saw that article where he's talking about his chessboard has failed. What Brzezinski didn't realize is, is when he wrote that stupid book, The, the Grand Chessboard, yeah. again, he's, he's a globalist technocratic wonk. And when he wrote that book uh, in 97, and when I, when I read it, he was talking about all the, you know, how, how important Ukraine is to the capturing of the Eurasian trade, of Eurasia. Because control of Eurasia te- is basically control of Africa. That, that, there's a connection there that most people don't realize. He's failed. And in the, in, in the grand chessboard, what happened is that you had a guy named Vladimir Putin step into the stage and come down and, and, and absolutely, uh, took his, uh, chessboard and, and, uh, shoved it down, or actually shoved it up, uh, Brzezinski's rear end. That's what happened to Brzezinski's grand chessboard. It's somewhere in his, in, in his, in his large colon. <laughs> along, <laughs> alongside a bunch of his other ideas. I hope it was Paul. Globalist. The, the, the whole thing that these globals have been working on for the, for damn near over a hundred years. Is this, 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 this fantasy called world government and world religion and world currency. The crap doesn't work. And what's happening is that these morons, these sycophants, these are idiots, inbred idiots, okay? What, 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 what they, what they don't realize and what they underestimated gravely is the power of human culture, human traditions, tribalism, which is the, the epitome of that of all those things, those genetic drivers that make us so unique and, and make us have a tribal mentality, the unique result, the apex expression of that is nationalism. And that's what's blowing up in front of their faces. Nationalism, sovereignty, this is what's erupting. So the question to the, 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 the new world order is, um, what are you guys going to do now? What's your next move? Because when you look at them and their next move, you're looking at a bunch of guys who are a bunch of mealy mouth little weaklings. He okay, said, so "What's what's what's making up the patriot movement? What's making up the the freedom movement? Is you know, and, and these guys might push us to the cliff. These guys might you know pu- try to pull off a war and get as many people killed as possible. But the cat's out of the bag at this point. Well, the cat's out of the bag. I mean, I, I mean, look, I, I, Rockefeller don't he doesn't live too far from me." The, the cat's out of the bag, but, but basically from birth, human beings have four fears. They're primordial fears, darkness, predators, abandonment, and chaos. Right. And they're really 
to this point of our conversation, still using three out of four of those very effectively. And and divide and conquer is a strong weapon. I, I mean, it's always going to resort back to we the people are going to make the changes. And, and, and there's no question about that. But I think we're all trying to answer how dark is it going to get first. Oh, it's going to get. It's always darkest before the dawn. Yeah. Yeah, I got one more question, and I, I want to, I want you, V, bullet point your recommendations as to what people should be doing right now to best protect themselves, their families, and their assets. Absolutely, and without giving any financial advice, what I would tell people to do is this, is it's number one, get the heck out of paper, okay? If, if, if you're a good trader, I, I have a buddies of, I have friends of mine who are still, you know, trading in the market, it's not an invest, investable market, but hell, man, it's a tradable market. And, you know, if, you, if you're good at trading, you know how to trade, go forth and trade. Make a killing. Make some money. Okay, and then take that money, put it into hard assets, put it into your preps, uh, so you're better situated and, and leveraged to deal with what is going to happen. Um, so once you do that, you want it to absolutely be in, 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 in physical metals. You want to have food stores. You want to have good, you know, potable water. Uh, those things are very vital, very important. Uh, if you have, the, you know, if you have those things taken care of, and if you're of the means where you can get the heck out of the country, get the heck out of the country, leave, you know, get a secondary location set up. If nothing happens, or if it doesn't be as bad as, you know, some people say it is, you know, the the, the fear porn guys make this like ten times worse than it actually will be. It's a transition. It's not the end of the world. It's a friggin' transition. Let's go through it, come out of it, and rebuild on the other side. Now, those of you who are able to get out, you have a secondary location. Go to that secondary location, hang out, let the dust settle, let let the let the winds blow through, and then come back and pick up the pieces, see what you can leverage off. Of. Because there's going to be, even though with this great collapse that's coming, we're going to see the greatest creation of wealth that's going to be that's going to be created out of it. I so in totally other words, agree. My, yeah, in my, I tell my clients this all the time: the greatest transfer of wealth is about to take place. Do you want to get paid? That's basically it, because depressions don't kill wealth. They only transfer it. Bingo. And the thing is, uh, I think the greatest surprise to a lot of Westerners who seek a second location, judging by the quality of life and the peacefulness of it in many other countries, I don't think they're going to be returning too quick once the dust does settle. No, no. Uh, there's a lot of people that, that have uh, expatriated themselves. They're not coming back. They love where they are. V, it was great chatting together. And for all of our viewers, mention the best way they can stay in the loop. And if interested, the best way to reach out and get connected with you. Sure, absolutely. The best way to keep tabs on me is going to be the website Rogue Money. That's R-O-G-U-E-M-O-N-E-Y, RogueMoney.net. You can follow me on Twitter at the Rogue Money. And also the Rogue Money YouTube channel. That's uh, R-O-G-U-E space M-O-N-E-Y. Just put that into the search bar. You'll see this uh, this uh, icon of the screaming red gorilla. That is me. That is exactly what I look like. Uh, <laughs> so click, click and subscribe to that, and uh, you know, stay stay abreast with what's everything that's going on. I mean, it's it's pretty exciting. Like every Wednesday, I do a program with me and my buddy Big Swear. It's called Hump Days with Vic, with uh, Bix and V. It's very fun. It's very lighthearted. Uh, it's a great show. Fridays, Friday nights is a radio show where I get on there and uh, we cover the litany of different topics. Every morning, I try to do a mornings with V. We give you a rundown of the news for the day. And starting Monday, it's going to be uh, the Trading Terror Dome. Uh, it's going to be with me and uh, my buddy Dex, uh, the Vulcan. Dex is uh, basically a trader from Wall Street. This guy's uh, a, a serious badass when it comes to trading. So you can learn how to trade. I, I've given this story to people. There, are, there was a, uh, a, a, a woman who... Uh, you know, went to a terrible, messy divorce, uh, had no money, had, you know, kids that she needed to take care of. Um, what did she do? Rather than working at the perfume aisle in Macy's, she learned how to trade. She made a killing. I'm not, I'm not saying that everybody's going to be a millionaire, and granted she wasn't, but she made she made enough money to cover her rent, her expenses, where she doesn't have to worry. So whenever time, anytime she would run into a jam, she'd start trading. So learn how to trade. It could be a valuable tool, so Dex will teach you how to do that. Uh, again, it's not an investable market, but it's a tradable market. Be friggin' pragmatic. Don't get married to one idea. Learn. Learn and always keep, keep educating yourself. Learn how to leverage to, and exploit situations to your advantage. That's the best advice you can give everybody. You know something, uh, V? You just hit the nail on the head, my new friend, because uh, when people ask me what's the number one importance of any plan B, flexibility on the yep. run. Absolutely. That, 
That is, yeah, because it's not the strongest that survive. It's the ones who adapt to change the best. Bingo. V, I really know you're busy, and I can't thank you enough for taking a little bit of time to talk with us today. Definitely. Barry, it's a pleasure. Thank you.